This is episode 74. Today is Thursday, November the 22nd, 2012. I'm your host, Christina Consolo. And with me today is Jules, but I don't think she's going to be sticking around. She's got some turkey cooking and some people coming over. I had my Thanksgiving yesterday, so uh, I'm just going to be relaxing today. As you gather with your family and friends on this holiday, give them an extra big hug. We're going to be reading today from Behold a Pale Horse by Milton William Cooper. He was born May 6, 1943, died November the 5th of 2001. He was an American conspiracy theorist, radio broadcaster, and an author best known for the book that we're going to read from today. On the back cover of this book, which was provided to me by one of my listeners, Debbie Pinchon, it says, Bill Cooper, former United States Naval Intelligence Briefing Team member, reveals information that remained hidden from the public eye and has been top secret in government files since the 1940s. His audiences hear the truth unfold as he writes about the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the war on drugs, the secret government, and UFOs. By the way, today is the anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Bill is a lucid, rational, and powerful speaker whose intent it is to inform and to empower his audience. Standing room only is normal. His presentation and information transcend partisan affiliations as he clearly addresses issues in a way that has a striking impact on listeners of all backgrounds and interests. He has spoken to many groups throughout the United States and has appeared regularly on many talk shows and on television. In 1988, he decided to talk due to events then taking place worldwide, events which he had seen plans for back in the early 70s. Since Bill has been talking, he had correctly predicted the lowering of the Iron Curtain, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the invasion of Panama. All Bill's predictions were on record well before the events occurred. He's not a psychic. His information comes from top-secret documents that he read while on the intelligence briefing team and from over 17 years of thorough research. Mills Crenshaw of K-Talk in Salt Lake City said William Cooper may be one of America's greatest heroes, and this story may be the biggest story in the history of the world. Bill Cooper said, like it or not, everything is changing. The result will be the most wonderful experience in the history of man or the most horrible enslavement that you can imagine. Be active or abdicate. The future is in your hands. This is from Chapter 1, Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. The Illuminati's Declaration of War Upon the People of America. A note from the author, I read top secret documents which explained that silent weapons for quiet wars is the doctrine adopted by the policy committee of the Bilderberg Group during its first known meeting in 1954. A copy found in 1969 was in the possession of naval intelligence. The following document, dated May of 1979, was found in 1986 in an IBM copier that had been purchased at a surplus sale. It's entitled Top Secret Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, an Introductory Programming Manual. Welcome aboard. This publication marks the 25th anniversary of the Third World War, called the Quiet War, being conducted using subjective biological warfare fought with silent weapons. This book contains an introductory description of this war, its strategies, and its weaponry. 
for security purposes, it is patently impossible to discuss social engineering or the automation of a society or a nas on a national or worldwide scale without implying extensive objectives of social control and destruction of human life, such as slavery and genocide. This manual is in itself an analog declaration of intent. Such a writing must be secured from public scrutiny. Otherwise, it might be recognized as a technically formal declaration of domestic war. Furthermore, whenever any person or group of persons in position of great power and without the full knowledge and consent of the public uses such knowledge and methodology for economic conquest, it must be understood that a state of domestic warfare exists between said person or group of persons and the public. The solution of today's problems requires an approach which is ruthlessly candid with no agonizing over religious, moral, or cultural values. You have qualified for this project because of your ability to look at human society with cold objectivity and yet analyze and discuss your observations and conclusions with others of similar intellectual capacity without a loss of discretion or humility. Such virtues are exercised in your own best interest. Do not deviate from them. Authors note, Bill Cooper writes, I do recognize this document based upon the document's own admissions as a formal declaration of war by the Illuminati upon the citizens of the United States of America. I acknowledge that a state of war exists and has existed between the citizens of the United States and the Illuminati aggressor based upon this recognition. I present to you that the peaceful citizens of this nation are fully justified in taking whatever steps may be necessary, including violence, to identify a counterattack and destroy the enemy. I base this statement upon the God-given right of any peaceful people to defend themselves against attack and destruction by any enemy waging war against them. I cite the principles outlined in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States of America, and the fully recognized and acknowledged historical precedents that have served as the justification for destruction of tyrants. The manual continues, Historical Introduction. Silent weapon technology has evolved from operations researched, a strategy and tactical methodology developed under the military management in England during World War II. The original purpose of operations research was to study the strategic and tactical problems of air and land defense with the objective of effective use of limited military resources against foreign enemies. It was soon recognized by those in positions of power that the same methods might be useful for controlling a society, but better tools were necessary. Social engineering requires the correlation of great amounts of constantly changing economic information. So a high-speed computerized data processing system was necessary, which could race ahead of the society and predict when society would arrive for capitulation. Relay computers were too slow, but the electronic computer invented in 1946 by J. Presper Eckert and John Malchi filled the bill. The next breakthrough was the development of the simplex method of linear programming in 1947 by mathematician George Danzig. With these inventions under their direction, those in positions of power strongly suspected it was possible for them to control the whole world with the push of a button. Immediately, the Rockefeller Foundation got in on the ground floor by making a four-year grant to Harvard College, funding the Harvard Economic Research Project for the study of structure of the American economy. One year later, in 1949, the United States Air Force joined in. In 1952, the original grant period terminated and a high-level meeting of the elite was held to determine the next phase of so social operations research. The Harvard project had been very fruitful, as it was borne out by the publication of some of its results in 1953, suggesting the feasibility of economic engineering. The book was called Studies in the Structure of American Economy by Wassily Letonov, International Science Press Incorporated, White Plains, New York. Engineered in the last half of the decade of the 1940s, the new quiet war machine stood, so to speak, in sparkling gold-plated hardware on the showroom floor by 1954. The promise of unlocking unlimited sources of fusion atomic energy from the heavy hydrogen in seawater and the consequent availability of unlimited social power was possibly only decades away. 
the combination was irresistible. The quiet wars quietly declared by the international elite, also known as the Bilderberg Group, at a meeting held in 1954. Although the silent weapon system was nearly exposed 13 years later, the evolution of the new weapon system has never suffered any major setbacks. This volume marks the 25th anniversary of the beginning of the quiet war. Already this domestic war has had many victories on many fronts throughout the world. Political Introduction In 1954 it was well recognized by those in positions of authority that it was only a matter of time, only a few decades before the general public would be able to grasp and upset the cradle of power for the very elements of the new silent weapon technology were accessible for public utopia as they were providing a private utopia. The issue of primary concern, that of dominance, revolved around the subject of energy sciences. Energy. Energy is recognized as the key to all activity on Earth. Natural science is the study of the sources and control of natural energy, and social science, theoretically expressed as economics, is the study of the sources and control of social energy. Both are bookkeeping systems, mathematics. Therefore, mathematics is the primary energy science, and the bookkeeper can be king if the public can be kept ignorant of the methodology of the bookkeeping. All science is merely a means to an end. The means is knowledge. The end is control. Beyond this remains only one issue. Who will be the beneficiary? In 1954, this was the issue of primary concern. Although the so-called moral issues were raised, in view of the law of natural selection, it was agreed that a nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. Consequently, in the interest of future world order, peace and tranquility, it was decided to privately wage a war against the American public with an ultimate objective of permanently shifting the natural and social energy or wealth of the undisciplined and irresponsible many into the hands of the self-disciplined, responsible, and worthy few. In order to implement this objective, it was necessary to create, secure, and apply new weapons which, as it turned out, were a class of weapons so subtle and sophisticated in their principle of operation and public appearance as to earn for themselves the name silent weapons. In conclusion, the objective of economic research, as conducted by the magnets of capital and the industries of commodities and services, is the establishment of an economy which is totally predictable and manipulatable. In order to achieve a totally predictable economy, the low-class elements of the society must be brought under control. For example, they must be housebroken, trained, and assigned a yoke and long-term social duties from a very early age, before they have an opportunity to question the propriety of the matter. In order to achieve such conformity, the lower-class family unit must be disintegrated by a process of increasing preoccupation of the parents, and the establishment of government-operated daycare centers for the occupationally orphaned children. The quality of education given to the lower class must be of the poorest sort, so that the mote of ignorance isolating the inferior class from the superior class is and remains incomprehensible to the inferior class. With such an initial handicap, even bright lower-class individuals have little, if any, hope of extricating themselves from their assigned lot in life. This form of slavery is essential to maintaining some measure of social order, peace, and tranquility for the ruling upper class. Descriptive Introduction of the Silent Weapon Everything that is expected from an ordinary weapon is expected from a silent weapon by its creators but only in its own manner of junctioning. It shoots situations instead of bullets, propelled by data processing instead of a chemical reaction, originating from bits of data instead of grains of gunpowder, from a computer instead of a gun, operated by a computer programmer instead of a marksman, under the orders of a banking magnet instead of a military general. 
it makes no obvious explosive noises, causes no obvious physical or mental injuries, and does not obvious, obviously interfere with anyone's daily social life. Yet it makes an unmistakable noise, causes unmistakable physical and mental damage, and unmistakably interferes with daily social life, unmistakable to a trained observer, one who knows what to look for. The public cannot comprehend this weapon and therefore cannot believe that they are being attacked and subdued by one. The public might instinctively feel that something is wrong, but because of the technical nature of the silent weapon, they cannot express their feeling in a rational way or handle the problem with intelligence. Therefore, they do not know how to cry for help. They do not know how to associate with others to defend themselves against it. When a silent weapon is applied gradually, the public adjusts or adapts to its presence and learns to tolerate its encroachment on their lives until the pressure becomes too great and they crack up. Therefore, the silent weapon is a type of biological warfare. It attacks the vitality, options, and mobility of the individuals of a society by knowing, understanding, manipulating and attacking their sources of natural and social energy and their physical, mental, and emotional strengths and weaknesses. Theoretical Introduction, and there's a quote, Give me control over a nation's currency, and I care not who makes its laws, from Mayor Amschel Rothschild, 1743 to 1812. Today's silent weapons technology is an outgrowth of a simple idea discovered succinctly expressed and effectively applied by the quoted Mr. Mayor Rothschild. Mr. Rothschild discovered the missing passive component of economic theory known as economic inductance. He, of course, did not think of his discovery in these 20th century terms, and to be sure mathematical analysis had to wait for the second industrial revolution, the rise of the theory of mechanics and electronics, and finally the invention of the electronic computer before it could be effectively applied in the control of the world economy. General Energy Concepts In the study of energy systems, there always appears three elementary concepts. These are potential energy, kinetic energy, and energy dissipation. And corresponding to these concepts, there are three idealized, essential, pure physical counterparts called passive components. Number one, in the science of physical mechanics, potential energy is associated with a physical property called elasticity or stiffness and can be represented by a stretched spring. In electronic science, potential energy is stored in a capacitor instead of a spring. This property is called capacitance instead of elasticity or stiffness. Number two, in the science of physical mechanics, Kinetic energy is associated with a physical property called inertia or mass and can be represented by a mass or a flywheel in motion. In electronic science, kinetic energy is stored in an inductor instead of a mass. This property is called inductance instead of inertia. Number three, in the science of physical mechanics, Energy dissipation is associated with a physical property called friction or resistance and can be represented by a dash pot or other device which converts system energy into heat. In electronic science, dissipation of energy is performed by an element called either a resistor or a conductor, the term resistor being the one generally used to express the concept of friction and the term conductor being generally used to describe a more ideal device, a wire, employed to con convey electronic energy efficiently from one location to another. The property of a resistance or conductor is measured is either resistance or conductance reciprocals. In economics, these three energy concepts are associated with one, economic capacitance, two, economic conducence, and three, economic inductance. All of the mathematical theory developed in the study of one energy system can be immediately applied in the study of any other energy system, for example, economics. Mr. Rothschild's Energy Discovery What Mr. Rothschild had discovered was the basic principle of power, influence, and control over people as applied to economics. 
That principle is, when you assume the appearance of power, people soon give it to you. Mr. Rothschild had discovered that currency or deposit loan accounts had the required appearance of power and can be used to induce people, inductance with people corresponding to ma like a magnetic field, into surrendering their real wealth in exchange for a promise of greater wealth. They would put up real collateral in exchange for a loan of promissory notes. Mr. Rothschild found that he could issue more notes than he had backing for, so as long as he had someone's stock of gold as a persuader to show to his customers. Mr. Rothschild loaned his promissory notes to individuals and to governments. These would create overconfidence. Then he would make money scarce, tighten control of the system, and collect the collateral through the obligation of contracts. The cycle was then repeated. These pressures could be used to ignite a war. Then we would control the availability of currency to determine who would win the war. That government, which agreed to give him control of its economic system, got his support. Collection of debts was guaranteed by economic aid to the enemy of the debtor. The profit derived from this economic methodology made Mr. Rothschild all the more able to extend his wealth. He found that the public greed would allow currency to be printed by the government beyond the limits of backing in precious metal or the production of goods and services, such as the gross national product. Apparent capital is paper and doctor. In this structure, credit presented as a pure element called currency, it had the appearance of capital but is in fact negative capital. Hence, it has the appearance of a service, but it is in fact a debt. It is therefore an economic inductance instead of a capacitance, and if balanced in no other way, will be balanced by the negation of population, such as with war or genocide. The total goods and services represent real capital, called the gross national product, and currency may be printed up to this level and still represent economic capacitance, but currency printed beyond this level is subtractive which represents the introduction of economic inductance and constitutes notes of debt. War is therefore the balancing of the system by killing the true creditors. And falling back on whatever is left of the resources of nature in the regeneration of those resources. Mr. Rothschild had discovered that currency gave him the power to rearrange the economic structure to his own advantage. To shift economic inductance to those economic positions which would encourage the greatest economic instability and oscillation. The final key to control had to wait until there was sufficient data and high-speed computing equipment to, cle to keep close watch on the economic oscillations created by price shocking and excess paper energy credits, paper inductance, or inflation. The economic model. The Harvard Economic Research Project, which began in 1948, was an extension of World War II operations research. Its purpose was to discover the science of controlling an economy. At first the American economy, and then the world economy. It was felt with sufficient mathematical foundation and data. It would be nearly as easy to predict and control the trend of an economy as to predict and control the trajectory of a projectile. Such has proven to be the case. Moreover, the economy has been transformed into a guided missile on target. The immediate aim of the Harvard project was to discover the economic structure, what forces change in that structure, and how the behavior of the structure can be predicted, and how it can be manipulated. What was needed was a well-organized knowledge of the mathematical structures and interrelationship of investment, production, distribution, and consumption. To make a short story of it all, it was discovered that an economy obeyed the same laws as electricity and that all of the mathematical theory and practice and computer know-how developed for the electronic field could be directly applied in the study of economics. This discovery was not openly declared, and its more subtle implications were and are kept close a closely guarded secret. For example, that in an economic model, human life is measured in dollars, and that the electric spark generated when opening a switch connected to an active inductor is mathematically analogous to the initiation of a war. Economic Inductance 
An electrical inductor has an electric current as its primary phenomenon and a magnetic field as its secondary. Corresponding to this, an economic inductor has a flow of economic value as its primary and a population field as its secondary. When the flow of economic value diminishes, the human population field collapses in order to keep the economic value flowing. In extreme case, this would be war. The public inertia is a result of consumer buying habits, expected standard of living, etc., and is generally a phenomenon of self-preservation. Time flow relationships and self-destruction. An ideal industry may be symbolized electronically in various ways. The simplest way is to represent a demand by a voltage and a supply by a current. When this is done, the relationship between the two become, become what is called an admittance, which can result from three economic factors, hindsight flow, present flow, and foresight flow. Foresight flow is the result of that property of living entities to cause energy to be stored for a period of low energy, storing up for a winter season. It consists of demands made upon an economic system for that period of low energy. In other words, prepping. This creates excessive economic inductance, which can only be balanced with economic capacitance, true resources or value in goods and services. Social welfare is nothing more than an open-ended credit balance system, which creates a false capital industry to give non-productive people a roof over their heads and food in their stomachs. This can be useful, however, because the recipients become state property in return for the gift, a standing army for the elite. For he who pays the piper picks the tune. Those who get hooked on the economic drug must go to the elite for a fix. In this, the method of introducing large amounts of stabilizing capacitance is by borrowing on the future credit of the world. This is a fourth law of motion, onset, and consists of performing an action and leaving the system before the reflected reaction returns to the point of action, a delayed reaction. The meaning of surviving the reaction is by changing the system before the reaction can return. By this means, politicians become popular in their own time and the public pays for it later. In fact, the measure of such a politician is the delay time. They must eventually resort to war to balance the account because war ultimately is merely the act of destroying the creditor and the politicians are the publicity hired hitmen that justify the act to keep the responsibility and blood off the public conscience. If people really cared about their fellow man, they would control their appetites, so they would not have to operate on a credit or welfare social system which steals from the worker to satisfy the bum. Since most of the general public will not exercise restraint, there are only two alternatives to reduce the economic inductance of the system. Number one, let the populace bludgeon each other to death in war, which will only result in a total destruction of the living earth. Or number two, take control of the world by the use of economic silent weapons in the form of quiet warfare and reduce the economic inductance of the world to a safe level by a process of benevolent slavery and genocide. The latter option has been taken as the obviously better option. At this point, it should be crystal clear to the reader why absolute secrecy about the silent weapons is necessary. The general public refuses to improve its own mentality and its faith in its fellow man. It has become a herd of proliferating barbarians and, so to speak, a blight upon the face of the earth. They do not care enough about economic science to learn why they have not been able to avoid war despite religious morality, and their religious or self-gratifying refusal to deal with earthly problems renders the solution of the earthen problem unreachable by them. It is left to those few who are truly willing to think and survive as the fittest to survive, to solve the problem for themselves as the few who really care. Otherwise, exposure of the silent weapon would destroy our only hope of preserving the seed of the future of true humanity. Amplification of Energy Sources The next step in the process of designing an economic amplifier is discovering the energy sources.
The energy sources which support any primitive economic system are, of course, a supply of raw materials and the consent of the people to labor and consequently assume a certain rank, position, level, or class in the social structure. For example, to provide labor at various levels in the pecking order. Each class, in guaranteeing its own level of income, controls the class immediately below it, hence preserving the class structure. This provides stability and security, but also government from the top. As time goes on and communication and education improve, the lower class elements of the social labor structure become knowledgeable and envious of the good things that the upper class members have. They also begin to attain a knowledge of energy systems and the ability to enforce their rise through the class structure. This threatens the sovereignty of the elite. If this rise of the lower classes can be postponed long enough, the elite can achieve energy dominance and labor by consent no longer will hold a position of an essential economic energy source. Until such energy dominance is absolutely established, the consent of people to labor and to let others handle their affairs must be taken into consideration, since failure to do so could cause the people to interfere in the final transfer of energy sources to the control of the elite. It is essential to recognize that at this time, public consent is still an essential key to the release of energy in the process of economic amplification. Therefore, consent as an energy release mechanism will now be considered. The artificial womb. From the time a person leaves its mother's womb, its every effort is directed towards building, maintaining, and withdrawing into artificial wombs various sorts of substitute protective devices or shells. The objective of these artificial wombs is to provide a stable environment for both stable and unstable activity, to provide a shelter for the evolutionary processes of growth and maturity, for example survival, to provide security for freedom, and to provide defensive protection for offensive activity. This is equally true of both the general public and the elite. However, there is a definite difference in the way each of these classes go about the solution of problems. The political structure of a nation and dependency. The primary reason why the individual citizens of a country create a political structure is a subconscious wish or desire to perpetuate their own dependency relationship of childhood. Simply put, they want a human god to eliminate all risk from their life, pat them on the head, kiss their bruises, put a chicken on every dinner table, clothe their bodies, tuck them into bed at night, and tell them that everything will be all right when they wake up in the morning. This public demand is incredible, so the human god, the politician, meets incredibility by promising the world and delivering nothing. Who's the bigger liar, the public or the godfather? This public behavior is surrender born of fear, laziness, and expedientiary. It is the basis of the welfare state as a strategic weapon useful against a disgusting public. Action and Offense Most people want to be able to subdue and or kill other human beings which disturb their daily lives, but they do not want to have to cope with the moral and religious issues which such an overt act on their part might raise. Therefore, they assign the dirty work of others, including their own children, so as to keep the blood off their own hands. They rave about the humane treatment of animals and then sit down to a delicious hamburger from a whitewashed slaughterhouse down the street and out of sight. But even more hypocritical, they pay taxes to finance a professional association of hitmen, collectively called politicians, and then complain about corruption in government. Responsibility Again, most people want to be free to do things, to explore, etc., but they are afraid to fail. The fear of failure is manifested in irresponsibility, and especially in delegating those personal responsibilities to others where success is uncertain or carries possible or created liabilities, which the person is not prepared to accept. They want authority, but they will not accept responsibility or liability, so they hire politicians to face reality for them. People hire politicians so that they can, number one, obtain security without managing it, 
Number two, obtain action without thinking about it. Three, inflict theft, injury, and death upon others without having to contemplate either life or death. Four, avoid responsibility for their own intentions. And five, obtain the benefits of reality and science without exerting themselves in the discipline of facing or learning either of these things. They give the politicians the power to create and manage a war machine to provide for number one, the survival of the nation or womb. Number two, prevent encroachment of anything upon the nation or the womb. Number three, destroy the enemy who threatens the nation or the womb. And number four, destroy those citizens of their own country who do not conform for the sake of stability of the nation or the womb. Politicians hold many quasi-military jobs, the lowest being the police, which are soldiers. The attorneys and the CPAs next, who are spies and saboteurs and the judges who shout the orders and run the closed union military shop for whatever the market will bear. The generals are industrialists. The presidential level of commander-in-chief is shared by the international bankers. The people know that they have created this farce and financed it with their own taxes and consent, but they would rather knuckle under than be the hypocrite. Thus a nation becomes divided into two very distinct parts a subnation that's docile and a subnation that's political. The political subnation remains attached to the docile subnation, tolerates it, and leeches its substance until it grows strong enough to detach itself and then devour its parent. The draft. Few efforts of human behavior modification are more remarkable or more effective than that of the socio-military institution known as the draft. A primary purpose of a draft or other such institution is to instill, by intimidation, into the young males of a society the uncritical conviction that the government is omnipotent. He is soon taught that a prayer is slow to reverse what a bullet can do in an instant. Thus a man trained in a religious environment for 18 years of his life can, by this instrument of the government, be broken down, be purged of his fantasies and delusions in a matter of mere months. Once that conviction is instilled, all else becomes easy to instill. Even more interesting is the process by which a young man's parents, who purportedly love him, can be induced to send him off to war to his death. Although the scope of this work will not allow this matter to be expanded in full detail, nevertheless a coarse overview will be possible and can serve to reveal those factors which, much be, which must be included in some numerical form in a computer analysis of social and war systems. We begin with the tentative de definition of the draft. The draft is an institution of compulsory collective sacrifice and slavery devised by the middle-aged and the elderly for the purposes of pressing the young into doing the public dirty work. It further serves to make the youth as guilty as the elders, thus making criticism of the elders by the youth less likely. It is marketed and sold to the public under the label of patriotic or national service. Once a candid economic definition of the draft is achieved, that definition is used to outline the boundaries of a structure called a human value system, which in turn is translated into the term of game theory. The value of such a slave, slave laborer is given in the table of human values, a table broken down into categories by intellect, experience, post-service job demand, etc. Some of these categories are ordinary and can be tentatively evaluated in terms of the value of certain jobs for which a known fee exists. Some jobs are harder to value because they are unique to the demands of a social subversion. For an extreme example, the value of a mother's instruction to her daughter, causing that daughter to put behind certain behavioral demands upon a future husband 10 or 15 years later. Thus, by suppressing his resistance to a perversion of the government, making it easier for a banking cartel to buy the state of New York in, say, 20 years. Such a problem leans heavily upon the observations and data of wartime espionage and many types of psychological testing.
but crude mathematical models such as algorithms can be devised if not to predict at least to predetermine these events with maximum certainty what does not exist by natural cooperation is thus enhanced by calculated compulsion human beings are machines levers which may be grasped and turned and there's very little difference between automating a society and automating a shoe factory enforcement Factor 1. As in every social system approach, stability is achieved only by understanding and accounting for human nature. A failure to do so can be, and usually is, disastrous. As in other social schemes, one form or another of intimidation is essential to the success of the draft. Physical principles of action and reaction must be applied to both internal and external subsystems. To secure the draft, individual brainwashing and programming and both the family unit and the peer group must be engaged and brought under control. Factor 2. The Father The man of the household must be housebroken to ensure that Junior will grow up with the right social training and attitudes. The advertising media, etc. are engaged to see to it that father-to-be is pussy-whipped before or by the time he is married. He is taught that he either conforms to the social notch cut out for him or his sex life will be hobbled and his tender companionship will be zero. He is made to see that women demand security more than logical, principled, or honorable behavior. By the time his son must go to war, father will slam a gun into Junior's hand before father will risk the consensure of his peers or make a hypocrite of himself by crossing the investment he has in his own personal opinion or self-esteem. Junior will go to war or father will be embarrassed. So Junior will go to war, the true purpose notwithstanding. Factor 3. The Mother The female element of human society is ruled by emotion first and logic second. <laughs> In the battle between logic and imagination, imagination always wins, fantasy prevails, maternal instinct dominates so that the child comes first and the future comes second. A woman with a newborn baby is too starry-eyed to see a wealthy man's cannon fodder or a cheap source of slave labor. A woman must, however, be conditioned to accept the transition to reality when it comes, or sooner. As the transition becomes more difficult to manage, the family unit must be carefully disintegrated. In state-controlled public education and state-operated child care centers must become more common and legally enforced so as to begin the detachment of the child from the mother and father at an earlier age. Inoculation of behavioral drugs such as Ritalin can speed the transition for the child. Caution. A woman's impulsive anger can override her fear. An irate woman's power must never be underestimated, and her power over a pussy-whipped husband must likewise never be underestimated. It got women the vote in 1920. Factor 4. Junior The emotional pressure for self-preservation during time of war and the self-serving attitude of the common herd that have an option to avoid the battlefield if Junior can be persuaded to go. Is all of the pressure finally necessary to propel Johnny off to war? Their quiet blackmailings of him are the threats. No sacrifice, no friends, no glory, no girlfriends. Factor 5. The sister. And what about Junior's sister? She is given all the good things of life by her father and taught to expect the same from her future husband regardless of the price. Factor 6. Cattle. Those who will not use their brains are no better off than those who have no brains. And so this mindless school of jellyfish, father, mother, son, and daughter, become useful beasts of burden or trainers of the same. This is the end of the document, Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. Bill Cooper writes, so now you know. This chapter could only come in the beginning. Your preconceived ideas had to be shattered in order for you to understand the rest of this book. In this chapter, you can see every step that the elite have taken in their war to control this once great nation. You can see the steps that will be taken in the future. You can no longer pretend innocence. Your denial of the cons conspiracy will fall on deaf ears. 
This book is part of the education that will give Americans the weapons needed in the coming months and years of hardship as the New World Order struggles to be born. Many will argue that silent weapons for quiet wars is only a bogus conglomeration of words for which the writer has never taken credit or responsibility. Those who do so ignore the self-evident truths contained within the document. They ignore these truths because they are an indictment of their own ignorance which they cannot face. The document first found in 1969 correctly outlines events which subsequently came to pass. It cannot be ignored or dismissed. The document is genuine. Its truths cannot be negated or shrugged away. The message is this. You must accept that you have been cattle and the ultimate consequence of being cattle, which is slavery, or you must prepare to fight and, if necessary, die to preserve your God-given right to freedom. That last sentence is the real reason why people choose to ignore silent weapons for quiet wars. People are not ready to admit that they have been cattle. They are not prepared to fight and, if necessary, die for freedom. It is an indictment of the citizens of the United States of America. And that is the total confirmation of the truth of the information contained in silent weapons for quiet wars. The members of the Bilderberg Group are the most powerful financiers, industrialists, statesmen, and intellectuals who get together each year for a private conference on world affairs. The meetings provide an informal, off-the-record opportunity for international leaders to mingle and are notorious for the cloak of secrecy that they are held under. The headquarters office is in The Hague in Switzerland, the only European country never invaded or bombed during World Wars I and II. Switzerland is the seat of world power. The goal of the Bilderberg Group is a one-world totalitarian socialist government and economic system. Take heed as time is running short. You must understand that secrecy is wrong. The very fact that a meeting is secret tells me that something is going on that I would not approve. Do not ever believe that grown men meet on a regular basis just to put on fancy robes, hold candles, and gladhand each other. George Bush, when he was initiated into the skull and bones, did not lie naked in a coffin with a ribbon tied around his genitalia and yell out details of all his sexual experiences because it was fun. He had much to gain by accepting initiation into the order, as you can now see. These men meet for important reasons, and their meetings are secret because what goes on during the meetings would not be approved by the community. The very fact that something is secret means there is something to hide. John Robeson wrote in Proofs of a Conspiracy in 1798, and I believe he said it best in the following passage from the book, Nothing is so dangerous as a mystic association. The object remaining secret in the hands of the managers, the rest simply put on a ring in their own nose, by which they may be led about at pleasure, and still panting after the secret that they are better pleased the less of they see on their way. A mystical object enables the leader to shift his ground as he pleases, and to accommodate himself to every current fashion or prejudice. This again gives him almost unlimited power, for he can make use of these prejudices to lead men by troops. He finds them already associated by their prejudices, and waiting for a leader to co concentrate their strength and set them in motion. And when once great bodies of men are set in motion with a creature of their fancy for a guide, even the engineer himself cannot control. Say, far shalt thou go, and no farther. Is the common man really as stupid as the elite seem to believe? If he is, then maybe the average citizen is better off ignorant, being manipulated this way and that, whenever the elite deem it necessary. We will discover the answer very quickly when the common man finds that his e-ticket to fantasy land has just expired. And that concludes the reading from Behold a Pale Horse, Milton William Cooper, was fatally shot by a law enforcement officer at his Edgar, Arizona home after confronting deputies trying to arrest him and shooting one of them in the head. Authorities said that Cooper was carrying a handgun 
and fled when Apache County deputies identified themselves and tried to arrest him on charges of aggravated assault and endangerment stemming from earlier disputes with local residents. Federal authorities reported that Cooper had spent years trying to avoid capture on a 1998 arrest warrant for tax evasion and according to a spokesman for the U.S. Marshals Service, Cooper had vowed that he would not be taken alive. As I said earlier, as you gather with friends and family on this holiday today, give them an extra big hug. This broadcast is dedicated to Tony Barton and Devin Barton. May you both rest in peace. Please share love, caring, and concern for your fellow man. We'll be back next week. To keep in the news loop, make sure you check out my page on Facebook, Radchik radiation research and mitigation or fukushimafacts.com which has links to YouTube, Twitter and also the feed from the Rad Chick page. I also want to say a very special thanks to all the people who helped me post so we're able to keep up with the news pretty much 24 hours a day. There's seven other people that help me do this and none of us get paid doing it because we care about other people. Stay safe everyone and happy Thanksgiving. Words are flowing out like endless rain into a paper cup. They slither while they pass, they slip away across the U.